Um, we're reading today from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 to 21. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual, sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore do not be partners with them. For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. That is why it is said, Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. It's quite, a, it's quite a bit in there. But this morning, we're going to be focused on one verse that is often misunderstood among many churches, but to some, it is rarely given much thought. Sometimes the carnal mind cannot understand the things of the Spirit. My main focus is going to be a verse 10. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? Now, I'm sort of a person when it comes to the Word of God, it's like, it's like the two builders. Sometimes you need to dig deep to, uh, to get into the Word of God. And the difference between the wise and the foolish is that one dug deep. He really wanted to know. So this morning, my, f my main focus, what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? It says, do not get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now note, there are two commandments here. Don't get drunk, but be filled. I'm pretty sure that most of us have, have obeyed the first command. Not many drunk people today, are we? I hope not. <laughs> Any hangovers from last night? <laughs> now, I'm pretty sure most of us have obeyed this command in particular. But how are we going with the second command to be filled with the Spirit? Because this is, this is the will of God for us. In verse 17, it starts saying, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And there is nothing more important in this life than to understand and to do and to do the will of God. And the will of God for us is to be filled with the Spirit. Now, what does this mean? This is my main focus this morning. Some believe to be filled with the Spirit is like an empty bottle. Every so often the Holy Spirit has to come in and top you up, you know, like you're 10% filled and as you go along, he fills you again, again with himself. I've also been in a lot of places where they consider the Holy Spirit as, so, as some sort of a PowerPoint. That every, every so often you need to be charged in, you know, so, you can, so the Holy Spirit can fill you in. I don't think that's quite right. Some say also that you need a certain experience to be filled, to be, to be filled with the Spirit, like speaking another language in tongues. I have no problem with some of these things, but that's not what the Holy Spirit is all about. I believe that the Holy Spirit is one of the most misunderstood person of the Trinity, who he is and what he does. I remember my own experience. With, I remember the first time that I met the Holy Spirit, actually, and to me it was an experience. Uh, I remember when I was about 20, 25 years, years of age, and uh, I decided to go 
on a trip to Murray Bridge with the partner that I was at that particular point in time. And we were sitting at Murray Bridge uh, in, in a green grass r r right in front of the highway, and some people were passing by, and they were giving invitations to come to a concert. I never knew they were Christians. I actually thought this was a worldly concert, and, um, and, we're, and, we're, and we're going to a worldly show. So it was held at, it was held at um, Murray Bridge uh, High School, so we went down there. As we went down there, we heard this lady. She sang this beautiful song, actually. Uh, she witnessed that she had cancer and that God actually healed her. And she sang. It was really beautiful, beautiful time. And I remember the person, the person at the front, I don't, don't remember what the sermon was about or anything like that, and the person in the front gave an invitation. And he said, who wants to receive Christ? And I thought this was the most ridiculous thing I ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> I mean, come on, who wants to receive Christ, eh? We all do, don't we? <laughs> but anyway, you know, I thought it was really ridiculous, right? So, so I said to myself, right, I'll go at the front, and if I go at the front, maybe, just maybe, others, others will follow me. At that point in time, I understood something about church. I understood something like as I was moving from one place to another. So as I, so as I, so as I went in the front, there was about 20 people lined up. And, and, and I'm, looking, I'm looking at each one as the person prayed and, and, and is getting closer to me. And, and I'm thinking, hmm, I wonder what, what am I going to tell him? So he came to me and asked me, you know, what, does God want, what do you want God to do for you? I couldn't give him an answer, so I said, look, I'm having certain issues, you know. And, um, and, he, and he said to me, do you, want to be, do you want to receive the Holy Spirit? I haven't even heard of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Never even heard of the God, to be honest. Never in my entire life. I haven't even been to a church yet. And, and, when, I, and when I said, yes, I want to receive the Holy Spirit, a tongue of fire came upon me. You read it in the book of Acts. A tongue of fire came right on top of me and sat down there and, and all of a sudden, boom, I felt like something entered in, in, into me. He came right into me and, 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 and for some reason, I spoke in another language I had never even heard of before. And then I started jumping up and down like a yo-yo for a few minutes. I was really happy to have the Holy Spirit living, living inside of me. I have no idea what actually took place, but I, I understood something that God came to live inside of me. Now, the point that I want to make, Ron, yes, I was baptized with the Holy Spirit, but was I filled with the Spirit? No. Let's look what Paul has to say. Just a quick summary. Paul begins by telling us in Ephesians that we have been given a new identity. We are not longer what we used to be. We are something new. We were dead in our sins and trespasses, and we were slaves to the work of darkness. But now we are alive in Christ, and we are the servants of righteousness. Just a quick summary. Now, we have a complete new nature. We have abilities that we never had before. We have been given wisdom, and we are to live according to that wisdom. Paul is instructing us to be careful, to be watchful, how we live our lives. It matters to God how we live. God cares about the choices that we make. Paul continues on, on this theme, on the general theme of walking in a manner worthy of our calling, not in foolishness, but in wisdom. So in verse 18, Paul starts here. He says, Do not get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. The command here is to be filled with the Spirit. What exactly does it mean to be filled with the Spirit, and how do we know if we are Spirit-filled? These are two important questions, hopefully will be answered this morning. Now, first of all, every believer, every believer in Jesus Christ is baptized by the Holy Spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. The Father then baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and lives in us. This baptism of the Holy Spirit happens only once. The point that I, 
at the point of salvation, we have all of the Holy Spirit. Not 10%, 20%, or 75%. We have all of this Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is given to us without any measure. Now, in Romans 8, 9, shows the importance of this dwelling. However, you, you, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Holy Spirit dwells in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. If you do not have the Holy Spirit, you are not saved. As far as I can see from Scripture, to me personally, having the Holy, the Holy Spirit is a matter of life and death. Now, not only are we baptized with the Spirit, but we are also baptized into something far more greater than ourselves. We are baptized into the body of Christ. We all have the Holy Spirit together as one, not so much as individual, but together as a church. And this baptism only occurs at the point of salvation. Only, only occurs at the point of salvation, and this only happens once and is never repeated again. And we see this in Ephesians 1, uh, 1, 13, 14, that we were sealed with the Holy Spirit at the point of salvation. Now, I would also like to point out that some do experience this sealing, and some don't. It really doesn't matter. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. That's according to the Scripture. Now, the point that I want to make, um, the filling of the Spirit and the baptism of the Spirit are not the same thing. So what are they? Now, the question is this. It's not, do I have the Holy Spirit, or do I have all of the Holy Spirit? But does the Holy Spirit have you? To be filled with the Spirit is to come under His control. If a man is filled with anger, then the anger will control him. If a man is filled with greed, then the greed will dominate his life. If a man is filled with love, then that love will influence everything he does. And in the same way, when the Holy Spirit fills you, he will influence you. To be filled with the Spirit does not mean I have more of the Spirit. It means that the Holy Spirit has more of me. It says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, you can look at this in another way. Just as a person can choose to place himself under the influence of the control of alcohol, so a believer can choose to place himself under the influence and the control of the Holy Spirit. Being under the influence of alcohol is a matter of choice, and being filled with the Spirit is a matter of choice too. But God's will is that we do, be, that we do get filled with the Spirit. Now, what happens when a person gets filled uh, with alcohol? Well, the alcohol controls him, mentally and physically. The real issue in this verse is not consumption of alcohol, it's actually control. To be filled with the Spirit is to be influenced by Him so that we are no longer in control of our lives. He controls over us is not that of a puppet or, or, or a robot, but rather directing, influencing us, that is causing us to live differently than we did before. Left to our own, we will quickly return to a self-centered life. Being filled with the Spirit, like I said, does not mean I have more of the Spirit. It means the, the Spirit has more of me. The filling of the Spirit is something that, is, that takes continuously in our life. It happens over and over again. It is not a one-time experience for all, like the baptism. It is a repeated experience. In the original Greek language, the word filled uh, means complete and continuous. The idea is that a Christian is constantly allowing the, the Spirit of God to control and to influence him, to empower him, to convict him, and to illuminate him with his word. To be filled with the Spirit means, you know, uh, means keep on being filled. Yep. I put on, don't be satisfied with the memories of the past, what happened in the past, or, or the things that happened in the past. Uh, our Christian life is of continual progress and growth and maturity. 
is something that Jonathan has been teaching us. If we are just satisfied what we have now, you know, we will not be, f we, will, we will stop God from filling us from later on. And I heard someone say, and this is a really good saying actually. <laughs> now, think about this for a minute, right? Because Jesus is internal God. We will never know him fully. Finite minds simply cannot understand entirely which, which is infinite. To suggest that we already have sufficient knowing Christ is first a statement of supreme arrogance and second actually reveals that we do not even comprehend the basic divinity of Christ. We shall spend all eternity coming to understand more and more of our Savior and yet never come to an end because God is internal. Never walk around thinking that you know it all or you don't need to know things because there's always some new things that we can learn or we can understand some things that we have seen in a different light. Now, how are we filled with the Spirit? Well, if, well, if we look back in Ephesians, Paul has already talked about it. Show humility, gentleness, patience, and love. These are all the qualities that Jesus Christ has. Fulfill our roles in the body of Christ using spiritual gifts. Build one another in love. These are all signs of a spirit-filled person, and none of these things can be faked for a long period of time. They can only be done as we live by faith. We believe what God has said, and in our faith, we step forward and do what God says. It's not enough just filling our minds with the knowledge of God and understanding everything about Scripture. We also need to be filled with the Spirit of God in actually doing what we actually know. And now, and now, according to Ephesians, right? Now, different, different Bibles will tell you what it means to be filled in the Spirit, but that's another subject for another time. Now, according to, to Ephesians, the greatest evidence of being, spill, uh, of being filled with the Spirit are the changes in your heart that you made towards God. And this comes through Song. <laughs> and this comes through song. In verse 17, it says, Speak to one another in psalms and harms and spiritual songs and make melody, a melody to the Lord in your life. The spirit filled life is one of being full of song, delight, joy, and gladness because God's people have reason to rejoice. It's called salvation, people. We're saved. We've got reasons to rejoice. Well, if you, haven't, if you, if you, don't, if you don't understand what salvation is, please come and speak to someone. Eh? Right? Now, music is very important in our lives. Through it, we respond to God in praise and worship, as we did this morning. I hope, we didn't, I hope we didn't sing a lot of songs with just our minds, but I hope our hearts were in it, actually worshipping God. One of the most thrilling things, what Paul says about music, is there's no mention of quality. Every believer is, is to be involved in this. Every, be, every believer, even if you can't sing for peanuts, you can make melody to the Lord in your heart. This is not just on Sunday, but this, is, but this comes part of a life. So the spirit-filled life can only be a life of worship. Did you notice today? Did you, know, did you notice that? Eh? He says, speak to one another in harms and psalms and spiritual songs. It is not just to God, but to one another. It is not enough to keep the reality of the spirit-filled life to ourselves. We need to share it with other, with other Christians. Sarah, when you, when you share that song, your song, you know, I call it your song. When you share that song, what a blessing it was for everybody to hear that. And every time when I think of that, I still feel blessed. What does a spirit-filled person look like? Singing songs. Sharing their heart with one another. It was, it was absolutely brilliant. When, when we sing to each other, we teach each other about God, and also we get to know 
the other person a lot better. And uh, as as I was practic- as I was as I was preparing for this, I was going to say, Sarah, you know, you are an absolutely beautiful person. Let your light shine before everybody. Let everybody see the beautiful person that you really are, because that song really touched my heart, and I'm pretty sure a lot of people too has touched their hearts too. So, so don't be scared, you know, to sing songs to one another. I think it's, it's really good, actually. It's, it's biblical too, eh? Okay. Now, another, another evidence of a spirit-filled life is giving thanks to God, eh? In verse 10, it says, give thanks, give thanks always for all things to the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thankfulness will always replace the spirit of gossip slander and bitterness a spiritual filled person is a person who is grateful humble person he knows that he is an undeserved sinner we give thanks not for the things that we deserve but for the things we do not deserve anything that we do get it's only because of God's great because of God's great grace kindness and mercy towards us in Christ Jesus as far as I can see Thankfulness starts at the cross, at the cross of Christ. We have so much to be thankful. When we give thanks in all things, this demonstrates that we have come to the end of ourselves and the focus is not us, but it's on the other person. It says all things include the good things. We can also give thanks when bad things happen, not for the bad things themselves, but in their situation, we can still give thanks to God. Sometimes we need to surrender, to surrender to the will of God, no matter how much it hurts. We can still give thanks, and only a spirit-filled person can do this. My last point, what it looks like to be spirit-filled, in verse 20, 21, it tells us, it says, submit to one another in the fear of God. Now the tide has turned. Now, we are to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit, but we also to come to be under the influence of one another. If we do not know what this looks like, we will not, we will not, we will not know what it means to be spirit-filled. We cannot understand the importance of submission or seeing the beauty of submission until we understand the Trinity of God, who God is. In that relationship, in that relationship of Trinity, we understand what it is to submit to one another. In Philippians 2, 5, 8, it says, in your relationship with, with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to take, his, to take advantage of. Christ, Christ did not use his position, power, or influence as something to fulfill his own purpose. He only did the will of the Father. He submitted to him. This submission is voluntary and from one's own desire. A spirit-filled person recognizes the, the submission, the submissive, the spirit-filled person recognizes and submits to the authority structure that God has set up in church, home, work, and everywhere else. That's what the rest of the Ephesian covers, but I'm, I haven't got time to explain all that this morning. So it's really important to understand that we need to submit to the Holy Spirit and that we need to submit to one another. This is what the spirit-filled life looks like. In our submission, in our submission, we are more concerned about not self but we are more concerned about the other person. Now, if you didn't get anything at all from, from what I had to say, now, understand this, what it is to be filled with the Spirit. It is to give over to the Word of God so that the Holy Spirit can make you more like Jesus. This is not just today. This is just not tomorrow or yesterday or the day after that. It is ongoing. And that's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Let's pray. 
Lord, we thank you that you have given us the Holy Spirit. We pray that we pray that He will keep filling us a lot, keeping us alive and filling us with your life, with your goodness, and everything that you have to offer to us. We thank you for the wonderful work that He has done in our lives and that He's doing in His church. And Father God, we also need your help in this area to be filled by you, to be influenced by you, and also and also to influence us to love one another as you have loved us. Amen.